I don't know of anything better to follow victory in Jesus with than a baptism. And baptism demonstrates the victory that we have in Christ. Now, hear me on that. Baptism does not give us victory in Christ. Baptism does not wash away our sins. Baptism does not make us Christians. Baptism is our public profession of faith of what Jesus Christ has done for us. For just as they killed him, and he was buried, and he rose from the grave in victory, in baptism we are saying that just like Jesus, the old self is dead and gone, and we are raised up to walk in victory in Jesus Christ. With me in the baptistry is Lainey McCowan, and behind us are some other McCowans. And she is here today to bear witness to you of what Jesus Christ has already done for her. Lainey, I'm going to ask you one question. Are you trusting Jesus Christ alone for your salvation? Yes, sir. <laughs> and based on your testimony that Jesus is alive and lives in you, it is my honor, Lainey, to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Through baptism, we're buried into his death and raised to walk in newness of life. Howdy, Central. Some might say it's a good day to be here today. I would be one of those. Would you open your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 9? We are going through the book of Ecclesiastes. And one reason I like to preach through books of the Bible is because the single most important factor in reading, interpreting, and understanding Scripture is... You're getting better. It's context. And so we get the context of each passage as we're moving through it together. And if you've missed any weeks, you can sure go see those online. You can catch the videos and the audio online and, and catch up to those. But what's been going on is that Solomon repeatedly, and he really camped out on this the last couple of weeks that we looked at, was troubled by all the injustice in the world. And he keeps bringing up this this reality that we know to be true, that we look around and evil, wicked people seem to get away scot-free. Not only do they get away, they seem to get all these blessings and good things happening to them. While so many righteous people, good godly people, people trying to serve the Lord, get bad things happening to them. And Solomon says, you know, this is a great mystery and it just makes life seem meaningless. But we, we were able to see the last couple of weeks where he starts seeing some well, he starts getting in his own heart some resolution and seeing what's happening. And he basically comes to the conclusion and tells us, look, life is just short. And yeah, there may be injustice in the world. Indeed, there is injustice in the world. But in the end, there will be justice. And that justice will last forever. You know, we've seen some great examples or a, a particular great example of this disparity the last couple of weeks. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, Nabil Qureshi, 34 years old, a former Muslim who was traveling the world, defending the gospel and winning people to Jesus. A very influential young man, a speaker and an author, a young father with a, with a little girl, dies at the age of 34 from stomach cancer. And then you get a guy like Hugh Hefner, who has riches untold and lives to be 91 years old. Does that seem fair? It doesn't, but in the scope of eternity, 34 and 91 are the same almost. I mean, that's not even a second apart. Those are really, really close. This week, I even shared some reflections online about Hugh Hefner. In fact, it was interesting. I shared it. I, I wrote an old article for a men's ministry about it. That's coming out next, next year, but I decided to share it on Facebook, and it got 80-something shares, and it ended up making some people really mad that I would dare imply that Hugh Hefner might not be a born-again Christian. And, and I can't say who is a born-again Christian and who isn't a born-again Christian, but I would say if he was, he didn't live like one. And my point in sharing all this was to say to men, Hugh Hefner is not the kind of life we want to emulate. The parties, the wealth, the women, that's not something to pursue because I don't know that I've ever seen a more wasted life than Hugh Hefner's. And last week, the thrust of the sermon was 
about not wasting our lives, and we waste our lives when we start making bad decisions, when we start making foolish decisions, and we all make bad decisions, don't we? We all make some foolish decisions. Anyone in the room has never made a foolish decision. Right. We all do it. But when we run with those and we pattern our lives after those decisions, we can waste our lives. So today, based on what Solomon tells us, I, I want to talk to you about the advantages of wisdom because that's what Solomon talks about. But then I want to talk about how to make the most of our very short lives to live as wise people. We're in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 11 through 18. Solomon says, again, I saw that under the sun the race is not to the swift nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge, but time and chance happen to them all. In fact, it doesn't matter how smart you are, how rich you are, how strong you are, life's going to happen to you, and so is death. For man does not know his time, he says in verse 12, like fish that are taken in an evil net and like birds that are caught in a snare, so the children of man are snared at an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. I've also seen this example of wisdom under the sun, and it seemed great to me. There was a little city with few men in it, and a great king came against it and besieged it, building great siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor wise man, and he, by his wisdom, delivered the city, yet no one remembered that poor man. But I say that wisdom is better than might, though the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard." The words of the wise, heard in quiet, are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. Again, everybody dies. Good and bad things happen to everybody. They happen to good people and bad people and wise people and foolish people, and you don't know when it's coming, no matter how wise or how intelligent you are. You don't know that day. However, Solomon makes the case that even though wisdom won't give you all the answers, wisdom is a better way of life. Living wisely is better. Four things here he says that wisdom is better than. Wisdom is better first than renown. That's what he's getting at in verse 14 and 15. He talks about this little city with a few men in it. Great king comes against it. But verse 15 says there was found in it a poor wise man. By his wisdom he delivered the city, but no one remembered that poor man. Who is that guy? We don't know. It's not his fame. It's not about who he is. It's about what he did. It's his wisdom, and he's, con he's commended for that. Why in the world would anybody want fame? I don't understand why anybody would want fame. I don't understand why anybody would want to, would want to have to go out in public and never be left alone. I would, that would just be awful to me. And I don't understand why anybody would want to live under a magnifying glass all the time with all the critics, the people trying to take you down, the impossibly high standards placed on your lives. You know, we even see that in the Christian world. We see pastors who are, who are famous out there. Don't, man, I, I don't ever want to be one of those guys. And I know you're thinking, well, don't worry. <laughs> but I would hate to be one of those guys. I actually wrote my dissertation on one of these very famous preachers, a, a contemporary guy named Mark Driscoll. And I wrote it several years ago, and he was very gracious to me, and I got to see sort of behind the scenes what goes on, and, and um, just a big, sort of this big evangelical Christian empire that he had built, and he's just, a, he's one of the brightest people that I've ever met. But he had some character flaws, and his character flaws brought him down. And he didn't fall due to sexual immorality like a lot of preachers did, but he lost his ministry because of, of some things that he did. And when all these things started coming out, Man, the blogs from people who didn't even know him, ripping him to shreds. Who would want that kind of recognition? In fact, I was sitting in a room full of preachers when all this was starting to unfold. And since I had written a dissertation, I was suddenly the Mark Driscoll expert, and I'm really not. But we're in a room and somebody says, hey, Mike, what do you think's going on with Driscoll? Or what's, what's going to happen with Driscoll? And a guy sitting on the other side of me laughed and said, ha, ha, he's going down. And I looked at him and I said, why is that joyful to you? Why are you happy that a brother in Christ has sinned and damaged people? But isn't that what fame brings you? People love to see you 
fall. Who wants it? I remember having a conversation with one of my children one time who said to me, hey, Dad, wouldn't it be great if I got to be famous one day? I said, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. And yet many people self-promote. They want to be famous. Henry Blackaby uh, is, a, is a, one of these preachers that became kind of famous, but not because of anything he was, he was doing to promote himself. In fact, he was pastoring a little church, get this, in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Where is that? It's in Canada, I think in the middle of nowhere. And he was planting churches. I mean, he would preach at his church on Sunday morning and drive five hours to preach at another church and then drive home five hours. He was a nobody in a nowhere place. And you know what he says? He says, you don't need to promote yourself because if God knows where you are, he can cause anybody in the world to know where you are. Don't look for fame and recognition. Look for wisdom. Be wise. Do what you're supposed to do. Keep your head down. Do your job. Be a person of integrity. That's wisdom. Can I tell you about my favorite person in Scripture? If you have your Bible and want to look it up, he's in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, church, and he's telling them, I'm sending Titus to you. And he's commending Titus, and when he does that, and he says, I'm sending Titus to you. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 18, we meet my favorite person in Scripture. Okay, other than Jesus, y'all. I mean, don't, get, don't Jesus juke me here. 2 Corinthians 8, 18, Paul says, and we're sending Titus, and then in verse 18 he says, with him, we are sending the brother who is famous among all the churches for his preaching of the gospel. Who is that? We have no idea. I love that. What do we know about this guy? Everybody knows his message. Nobody knows his name. Wisdom is much better than renown. Be that guy. Secondly, wisdom is better than power. Wisdom's better than power. Verse 16, he says, I say that wisdom's better than might, though the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. You you won't get a fair hearing if you're speaking words of wisdom. A lot of people won't like it, but it's still better. You know, our president recently made a comment about North Korea that if we had to, we would totally destroy them. And the reality is the United States could destroy North Korea, couldn't we? We could, just, we could make North Korea a wasteland. But is that what we want to happen? Millions of innocent people, perhaps, dying? Is that really the way we want to play out? It's not. It might happen, but I think we would all agree that we'd like to see a better solution to North Korea, wouldn't we? So what is that solution? I have no idea. But isn't this why we don't just pray? We don't pray for the might and power. We pray for the wisdom of our president. We pray for the wisdom of other world leaders. And I think we're all aware that it doesn't matter how powerful we are as a country, our greatest threat is foolishness. Doing dumb things. Making bad decisions. And today... I wonder if you'd agree with me when I say that reason and logic are not winning the day. Reason and logic are not setting the course of our culture. Money, power, and violence are. People don't want to hear wisdom. People want to hear, what what do we want to hear? We want to hear from people who agree with us on everything. We want to tune into the news network that will stoke whatever fire it is we have going. We don't want to be challenged. We don't want to think reasonably today. And and in our world today, if you speak godly wisdom in today's culture, you're going to be shut down. If you hold to biblical views on sexuality and marriage, you will be marginalized as a bigot. If you believe in protecting the lives of little babies in the womb, you will be vilified as somebody who hates women. So power, the people in power, the people with the money often gain the upper hand. And that's what Solomon is saying here. Though the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words not ho- are not heard, it's still better than power. Thirdly, wisdom is better than volume. This is a great lesson for the church today. Verse 17 says, the words of the wise heard in quiet 
are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Volume is sort of the tactic of the day. Don't want certain viewpoints on your college campus? Yell and scream. Want to voice an opinion on social media? Use all caps and block anyone who disagrees with you. Someone gives you an argument you disagree with, insult that person's intelligence. What in the world has happened to respectful dialogue? Listen, Christians, we of all people, are we not people of the truth? Do we not claim that that the Bible is the very Word of God and is the truth? Then if we have the truth, we don't need to be yelling and insulting. If we have the truth, we should be the most reasonable, articulate, bright people in the culture to be able to stand calmly and firmly on what we believe without shouting others down. Wisdom's better than volume. We, as Christians, do we not see all human beings as created in the image and likeness of God? Even the people we disagree with, even the bad people in the world, are they not human beings and intrinsically valuable because of their identity as creations of God in His image? Then shouldn't we be the most respectful? Respectful, by the way, doesn't mean rolling over. It doesn't mean being weak. It doesn't mean having a spine. We can be respectful and stand on truth and speak our peace in an articulate way, but we need to do it with a Christian accent. Let's be wise. And then finally, wisdom's better than sin. Verse 18. By the way, don't let that word finally trip you up. We're not done yet. You get your money's worth. Wisdom, verse 18, is better than weapons of war, but one sinner, one sinner destroys much good. I don't know how many of you saw, but I posted an article this week written by uh, Tom Rainer titled, The Four Most Common Acts of Stupidity That Get Pastors Fired. I like to read things like that (laughs) because I'd prefer not to do that. By the way, the four things he listed were flirting dangerously with sexual boundaries, plagiarism. Now, let me just pause. Some of you might go, plagiarism, what's he talking about? There are a lot of preachers that preach other people's sermons. I actually had a student at seminary turn in a sermon to me for an assignment that he had downloaded off the Internet. It didn't go well for him. So, flirting dangerously with sexual boundaries, plagiarism, financial stupidity, and he's talking about misusing church funds, and social media madness. Now, I think we'd all agree that if your pastor falls into those things, or we could probably list dozens of more things, it wouldn't just be harmful to me, would it? If I do these things that can cost me my ministry, what have I done? I've done damage to my family because I've done damage to my livelihood. I've probably done damage to my relationship with my wife and my kids because I've broken their trust in whatever way that I've done this. I've done significant damage to the church and that I'm going to cause division in the church. I'm going to hurt the church by giving the church a bad reputation in the community, and in doing so, I'm going to hurt the cause of the gospel. So this is what Solomon's getting at when he says... One sinner destroys much good. But friends, don't think this is just for pastors. So many people think, well, I can do whatever I want to. I can sin, and it's nobody else's business. This is one reason that when you become a Christian, God brings you into a community of faith so we can hold each other accountable because you do not live in a vacuum. You are not an island unto yourself. And we all need to realize that when we sin, we can destroy so much good. And so we need, to be, we need to be wise. And that's our takeaway this week. Be wise. You know, when I first wrote this sermon, I wrote the takeaway as don't be stupid. And then I said, that doesn't sound very nice. So I changed it to don't be dumb. <laughs> and then I said, Mike, find a positive way to say that. So here it is. Be wise. Be wise is your takeaway. So how am I supposed to be wise? Well, on the one hand, to a degree, it's easy. No, I won't say it's easy. It's simple. Meaning it's simple to understand, not easy to do. Do what Scripture tells you to do. 
I mean, you look at, the, look at the prohibitions in Scripture, don't lie, cheat, steal. I mean, all those kinds of things, if you'll do those, that's wise living, right? And, and positively speaking, be honest, have integrity, be faithful. These are wise things you can do. But here's the reality that we all know. Every single decision I need to make is not addressed directly in Scripture. Now, there are principles that inform those decisions, but every decision is not addressed in Scripture. For example, you're offered a new job. Well, I don't know. This is a good job. That's a good job. Which job am I supposed to take? You can't find a Scripture verse that says, uh, go with this one. So how do you make those wise decisions? How do you make a wise decision on a purchase? And I mean, there are principles. If you can't afford it, don't buy it. But I'm talking about, you know, something you can't afford, something maybe you need. Do you buy this one? Do you buy that one? Do you buy this house? Do you buy that house? Do you buy this car or that car? Who are you supposed to marry? Again, principles for the kind of spouse you need are in Scripture, but it won't tell you, is this the one? So how do you make these decisions and live a wise life? So here's what I want to do. I want to give you five, this is going to be pretty brief, but to be wise, you need to be first saved. To be wise, you need to be saved. Now, I want to take a minute because I, was, I wrote that and I thought, you know, I wonder how many people will be in the room who'll go, I don't know what that means. In fact, I remember when I was not a Christian, I didn't know what saved meant. That's one of those churchy terms that we just throw around, isn't it? So let me tell you what saved means. Saved obviously means you're being rescued from something. You're being saved from something bad, right? So what are we talking about being saved from? Now, this, this really rubs some people the wrong way, but this is biblical. You're being saved from God. Now, you're being saved by God, but you're being saved from God. Because Scripture tells us that as sinners, and you're one and I'm one, as sinners, our sin has alienated us from God, has, listen, has made us enemies of God, and has made us become objects of his wrath. And when Jesus died, he didn't just suffer physically, although he did suffer that way, but he took, as your substitute, he took on all the wrath of God on your behalf. Now, there are a lot of people today like say, oh, no, 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 God is not a God of wrath. Jesus was not our substitute. Jesus just died to set a good example. No, that is unbiblical. Don't buy into that stuff that's going around out there. Jesus died to save us from the condemnation of God. And we need to realize that. There are some people who say, hey, preachers shouldn't talk about, you know, being afraid of God and that kind of thing. If you're not in Christ, you should be very afraid because God sees you as an object of his wrath and of that justice that is coming someday where there will be no escape from that wrath. That is why Solomon says twice in the book of Proverbs, Solomon, the same guy that wrote Ecclesiastes, says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of God. So the first thing we need to do is we need to realize that we're in trouble. We need to have this fear of God so that we can place our faith in Christ. Because this is, this is the really good news. Jesus died as our substitute. He took the wrath. He averted the wrath of God. By the way, the theological term for that is he is our propitiation. He propitiated or satisfied the wrath of God so that if we will place our faith in him, trusting what he did. That's why in the baptistry you hear me ask, are you trusting Jesus alone for your salvation? So that we trust not our good works, not our religion, not anything we can do, but we place our faith completely in who Jesus is and what he is, then we are saved. Jesus calls himself the truth. And friends, if you want to live wisely, you must be connected to him. Your life must be connected to the life of Christ. Your life must be connected to the truth if you're going to be wise. But that's not all. So to be wise, you need to be saved, and you need to be serious. Serious. Does that mean I shouldn't have any fun? I need to walk around like this all day. Hey, what's your religion? I'm a Christian. Get away. See, God is not some cosmic killjoy. In fact, Christians are supposed to be the most joyful people in the world. I love what C.S. Lewis said. C.S. Lewis said that the pursuit of joy is the serious business of Christians. 
So I'm not talking about having a serious look and not having any fun. You should have a lot of fun. By the way, as Christians, here's the great thing about our fun. It's the kind of fun where you don't have regret in the morning. That's, that's real fun, by the way. We are supposed to be serious in our faith, though. What I'm talking about is don't play around with your faith. Can I just say to you, if the extent of your Christian faith is some prayer you prayed in a baptism you did, you didn't really get it. Can I say to you that if your Christian faith consists of just showing up to church on Sunday morning, you didn't get it. I'm talking about walking and living out your faith in an effort to honor Jesus 24-7. I'm not talking about being perfect, but I'm talking about this is your attitude, this is your desire in life. So to be wise, you need to be saved, you need to be serious, you need to be serving. If you are saved... This means when you are saved, the Holy Spirit gives you new life. The Holy Spirit of God dwells in you, and He gifts you. He gives you at least one gift for the service of the kingdom in and through the local church. Local church membership is biblical and essential according to Scripture. If you're not a member of Central yet and you've been visiting, Get on board today. We're going to give you an opportunity in a minute to do that. But we need to be serving, and to be serving means that we are giving through the local church, in and through the local church, of our time and our money. Now, some of you visitors go, oh, there he goes. Preacher's looking for our money. I don't get your money. I'm on a salary, okay? It's not the way it works around here. One of these prosperity gospels, T.D. Jakes tweeted, it went viral this week, obey God and you will never be broke again. Translation, obey T.D. Jakes and T.D. Jakes will never be broke again. (laughs) We're not in that prosperity nonsense theme where we're trying to tell you that if you give money, you're going to get rich. It doesn't work that way. But I will tell you this. People come to me sometimes as pastors and say, man, financially, we're just really struggling. And I say, well, first question, you given your first 10% to God. Well, no, okay, then I can't help you. Because according to Scripture, you're stealing from God. And if you want to have financial freedom, stealing from God, forget it. Now, it's not just about that. That other 90% you need to be wise with. But if you want to be wise, take care of the basics. You need to be saved. You need to be serious. You need to be serving. And you need to be seeking. I mean really seeking the Lord on a daily basis. How do you do that? You're spending time in Scripture every day. And when I say every day, you guys, you miss a day, don't get caught up on that. I'm just talking about there's a consistency, a a regularity in your reading of Scripture and spending time in prayer, seeking the Lord and seeking His will for your life. But you're not, here's the great thing, we don't just seek Him through Scripture and prayer, but also through the godly and wise counsel of others. You need to have these wise people in your life. This is another reason for the local church. Hopefully, God has given you a godly spouse. That's where some of your wise counsel is going to come from. But listen to these people. Now, Bible and prayer come first. In fact, I had a mentor early on, and I would call him and say, oh, I've got this going on. I don't know what to do. And he'd say, well, how much time have you spent searching the Scripture and praying about it? Yeah, yeah, well, I'm going to do that, but I needed you to tell me what I need to do. And he would say, as soon as you get a word from the Lord, call me back. Click. What's that all about? So I'd call him in a week, and he'd go, you know what to do? And I'd go, yeah, but can I run it by you? Because I want to make sure. I want to check and see, is this, am, I, am I seeing the right thing to do? So if you're saved, if you're serious, if you're serving, if you're seeking, you need to be secure. What do I mean by that? You need to trust God. We were just having a conversation last night about a friend of ours in our family who is just paralyzed can't make a decision, paralyzed about any major decision. She's so concerned with doing the right thing and so afraid of doing the wrong thing, she just doesn't make decisions. And when she does, she second get, oh, I don't know if that was the right thing to do. I'm just not sure. And all my conversations with her were, chill out. Roll with it. Because here's the deal. If you're saved, if you're serious, if you're serving, if you're seeking the Lord, you need to have faith that He's going to lead you in the right direction. Trust Him. And if you're faced with a decision, if you're saved, if you're serious about your faith, if you're serving the Lord, if you're seeking the Lord, 
and you have security that he will lead you in the right direction, here's what you need to do with your decision. You ready for this? Do whatever you want. Do whatever you want. Whoa, did he just give me permission to do whatever I want? Well, first off, you don't need my permission, obviously. But I have, I've had people say, well, if you tell people they can do whatever they want, you're telling them they can sin. No, no, no. Because let me just give you an example. If you say, well, what I want to do is leave my wife and marry my neighbor, you're probably not saved. If you're thinking like that, well, you can't tell me if I'm saved. No, but a saved person, it'd be really hard for me to see a saved person doing that. But if you are saved... You're not serious about your Christian faith. You're probably not serving the Lord like you're supposed to. You're definitely not seeking the Lord like you're supposed to. You're not walking in faith with the Lord because he wouldn't lead you to do that. Because if you're saved, if you're serious, if you're serving, if you're seeking, and if you're secure, your heart will be aligned with the heart of God. I love Psalm 37, verse 4. It says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Listen to that. Delight yourself in the Lord... So if I delight myself in the Lord, what are the desires of my heart? They're the things of the Lord. If my delight is in the Lord, I'm going to desire what God desires. And he gives freely. The Christian life is the joy-filled life. God loves his children. You know, when my kids ask me for advice, and I'm thankful, my three kids come to me for advice. And you know one of the reasons they do that? They are confident that I would never give them advice that I didn't think was best for them. Here's the thing, though. I can be wrong. So, like, if my kids come to me and say, hey, I want financial advice, I say, well, this is my advice, but why don't you go talk to this person that's a lot smarter than I am about money? I always encourage them to check my counsel with somebody else. What are other godly people saying to you? But here's the thing. When we're seeking God, we know that God is good and God is wise, and what he does is always the right thing to do. And what he does is always for our good and for his glory. Yeah, life's a mess. It's a mess out there. It's injustice everywhere. And the temptation is just to say, well, I might as well just give in. Don't do it. Wisdom's better than that. It's better than renown. It's better than power. It's better than volume, and it's better than any sin you're going to get into. Be wise. Let's pray.